Well, good afternoon. And of course, it is a great honor to be here with you um, to discuss a very, very important topic. Um, so I bring greetings to Chairman Covey and the state board members and Dr. Atkinson and all those assembled. Um, today we are discussing the math one, two, and three content standards, what students should know and be able to do in those uh, courses. And we know that that is driven by policy, which clearly tells us the steps that we should take in that review process. We know that reviewing data and research, surveys, and other feedback is critically important. Bringing together our writing teams, uh, some of those folks I think are in the audience with us today, developing drafts of those proposed changes, submitting those drafts for public review and input, which we'll continue to do beyond today's discussion, uh, revising that draft as necessary and submitting it, of course, to the State Board of Education for discussion, and I say that word again, for discussion, uh, to ensure that we have adequate discussion uh, before a decision is made, and then, of course, conducting professional development and providing our teachers and administrators with guiding documents to help them implement the revised standards. I do want to say that being able to be a part of this process, the discussion has been going on for a while, but entering the room last week with K-12 math experts as well as IHE math experts, words like thoughtful, data-driven, and transparent were words that were stated throughout that process, and hopefully you will see that. I also want to clarify that this is about standards and not curriculum. There is a, a distinct difference between those two. So we are talking about the standards today, what students should know and be able to do, and we know that the curriculum is very often a local decision. We can provide recommendations, but at the local level they determine what documents, what resources and materials they are going to use to actually teach those content standards. So there were three points that I think are very important to make as um, we bring up Dr. Curtis, who will go very in depth with the process. Three things that are critically important really in any standards review process is to provide clarity for the standard. So what is it telling us that students should know and be able to do? The second piece of that has to do with sequencing of the standards especially when you're looking at courses such as math one, two, and three that very often will build upon each other as you go from course to course. And then of course you always want the rigor to be there because we want our students to grow in their preparedness for their career choice or for their higher ed opportunities. So those three pieces are critically important. What we decided to do in the presentation is give you a sample of an original content standard and what that standard may be as a rewritten version for that content standard. So this is an example of a Math 1 standard that specifically speaks to the graphing of a two-variable equation. Now you can tell that as our experts have rewritten that standard, it talks about representing the set of all solutions to that equation. Remember, one of the three things I talked about in standards revisions has to do with rigor. And so what you'll see from the first standard on the left-hand side, the original Math 1 standard, to the rewritten standard, is bringing in a problem-solving aspect to the work, where students are asked to find different sets of solutions using that particular equation. Another example is to look at an original Math 2 standard. This one has to do with an aspect of algebra. You'll notice again that from the original content standard for math two, it talks about showing that it is a true quadratic polynomial. But when you look at the rewritten version, again, we're asking students to determine the number and potential types of solutions where you could use those functions. So again, we're needing our students to actually use math in problem solving, which again takes it to a higher level of rigor. As you go through those content standards documents that have been posted, you will see numerous examples of this. We're trying to take it to a different level 
trying to provide more clarity around the work, trying to be more specific for teachers about exactly what we want the students to know and be able to do um, as we move forward. So I will at this time call up Dr. Jennifer Curtis and she will go deeper into the work but we also want to recognize Dr. Tiffany Perkins, who is a part of our team. And we're going to continue this process of receiving feedback over the next few weeks. And of course, hearing your feedback, which we are certainly looking forward to, and ensuring a level of transparency for all of the folks that are directly impacted by this work. So I will turn it over to Dr. Curtis. Thank you, Dr. Petrie Martin. Chairman Covey, members of the board, Dr. Atkinson, it's my pleasure to be back here again this month to provide some details so that we can have an informed discussion and so that the board may continue to discuss both the process and the standards that we've put forward. So I'd like to go a little bit more in depth on the policy and procedures that Dr. Petrie Martin referenced. Um, we shared some of this with you last month at the work session in Wilmington. In February and March, in accordance with our state board policy, we convened a data review committee to complete a data analysis and provide guidance for writing teams. In March and April, writing teams met to produce a first draft of revised high school standards. We then provided that draft to all LEAs and charter schools in the state as well as a survey to solicit their feedback, and we were treating them as though they're an extension of the writing team. Our goal was to give every teacher and district and charter school an opportunity to provide feedback to the writing teams so that they could apply that and create a second draft. That happened on April 28th. You heard Dr. Petrie Martin mention a meeting last week in Greensboro where the writing teams met to analyze all of that feedback and to create a second draft. And you have some of that uh, feedback as your attachments. So just a reminder of the very general data that was used in this process. The development of the data review committee recommendations for revisions came from several sources, including the Academic Standards Review Commission's final report submitted in December, teacher and regional focus groups math leader focus groups, parent surveys, community surveys, and teacher surveys. That committee then made recommendations to writing teams, and they also used the LEA feedback from the first draft that I just mentioned. A little bit more specifically about those pieces of data, just as a reminder from last month, here are some numbers for you. We had over 3,300 teacher responses, kindergarten through math three. Uh, we also specifically had just about 600 teacher responses for high school math. We conducted a community survey January through April of last year. We held focus groups in all eight regions. Every LEA was represented in the state. We had over 200 teachers meet very specifically by grade band to provide us detailed feedback. We went to the North Carolina Council of Teachers of Mathematics leader session and conducted a focus group with math leaders, over 150 of them. And then we also waited for the Academic Standards Review Commission's final report and incorporated all of that data. That is the data that the committee looked at to come up with common themes and advice for the writing groups. So back to the overall process. The LEAs looked at that first draft. They convened their own committees to provide district level feedback to us. That feedback was due April 26th. It is both quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative piece I'm gonna share with you in a minute. The qualitative piece was attached, were three of the attachments for you to read through comments. And again, we did a very quick anal analyzing and applying to inform the second draft, which I'll share that process with you as well. Moving forward, we'd like you to receive this draft and feedback today and open the discussions. A public survey window will open immediately following this meeting, and that public comment period will add to our feedback cycle. We will repeat the same cycle again with the feedback that comes in. We'll bring this back to you as an action <coughs> item in June. So let's take a little bit, little look at the data from the surveys. 
We had a response rate of 75%, which is very good. Um, 86 of our LEAs responded. This shows 93 responses because we had some duplication. And we did get a few charter schools that responded as well. So I'd like to take you through each question very quickly um, and show you both a graph, a pictorial representation, as well as the data itself. So we asked LEAs if the geometry standards were regrouped by course according to the advice that came from teachers across the state and the ASRC. And we asked them for a statement that best represents their team's opinion of this grouping. And you can see overwhelmingly that people felt that the regrouping either met the needs of students or came close to meeting the needs of students but needed further revision. And here is how the numbers break down pretty evenly between those two, with only 4% stating that the regrouping um, they did not feel met the needs of students. We asked the same question about the algebra standards, how they went through all three courses, and if it met what teachers and leaders across the state, as well as the ASRC, had told us to do with the standards, um, and whether or not what we did with that met the needs of students. Again, very evenly split. Um, in this case, 55% said the regrouping met the needs of students. Now, I just want to pause for a minute and remind you that these are comments on the first draft. And then we asked them, in looking at the first draft of standards for high school, did they provide greater clarity than the previous standards known as Math 1, 2, and 3? And this was a big moment for me, because clarity is what we heard loud and clear through the data. Um, from every group. They wanted us to bring a clear picture of what was to be taught in each course. And so on first draft, we had over an 86% um, percent approval that yes, we had brought greater clarity with the first draft. And then we asked for their opinion as a team, as a school district, what was their opinion of the progression of the draft standards for each conceptual category? Did it meet the needs of students? Did it come close? Did it not meet? And the data, again, is very similar here, very consistent to what we saw in the other questions, that it either came close or met the needs of the students. So you would wonder, well, what's the difference? And that's where we got into the qualitative data. That's where we were able to ask them specifically what we needed to change in order to meet the needs of students. And so there were three open-ended questions. We asked them for suggestions for revisions of the first draft. We asked for their professional opinion on the draft standards, whether or not it provide a focused direction for teachers in each course by limiting the standards that were repeated in multiple courses. And then we asked for any additional comments that they wanted to share. And again, I've listed the attachments up here for you to see that raw data. I'm gonna pause for a minute here. Um, Chairman Kobe, I don't, and I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, I'm not sure if you want me to go through and take questions on all that data I just, or continue on with the process. Just wanted to give everybody an opportunity. Yes, sir. I'll preface this with mathematics is not my content area, but I do have a question. When we talk about regrouping standards, does that, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do this on the iPad. Um, obviously, I'm not a math or technology person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Everybody's a math person. <laughs> when you talk about regrouping standards, and we're talking about math, this implementation is for August. Yes, ma'am. That is, well, that is what we're discussing right, here. That, today. Well, that's right. what I'm saying. I just want to be clear that we're talking about a pretty quick turnaround here. And when we talk about regrouping standards, um, my assumption is that doesn't require the same level of professional development as when we originally rolled out the standards, because you're not, the standards aren't changing, they're just being clarified, regrouped, sequenced differently, perhaps. Is that a correct or incorrect That is, that is very correct, yes. Because okay. that's, that's a concern. And in fact, we um, have reached out to some of our district leaders and asked that question. Um, 
and we've received some verbal and written feedback that while at first they were concerned about the timetable, that now that they've seen the draft, it is very manageable. And they're already, many districts are already putting tentative plans in place to revise pacing guides and that sort of thing. One follow-up. I, I think that, you know, most people in the world are smarter than I am, so you may not have to do this, but I think that may be a good way to clarify some of this, is to say, you know, teachers have already been provided with a lot of professional development around the math standards. We are regrouping, we are clarifying, we're changing sequence or whatever, but I think that a lot of the pushback we got before was it was too fast, it was too fast. And, and you know, for me, I'm looking at this one as regrouping something different than new standards. And I mean, clearly it is, I, I see that, but just I, I think a real clear message about that would be helpful to not have the kind of pushback we had before. Other questions? When are the pacing guides to be <coughs> completed if you're looking to move this into August? Pacing guides are done at the local level as well as unit plans and Dr. Petrie Martin mentioned the um, curriculum is <coughs> developed at the at the LEA level. What we would provide, and I have a slide for you later on, is professional development around the changes on what topics moved, if they moved. We would, we've also begun work, um, whether it's for this year or any other year, on a professional development of resource for teachers, a very interactive, fluid resource that no matter what the standards are, we can provide things like open educational resources, suggestions for teaching methods, that sort of thing. But when are the, when are the locals to have the time to, if this is to be implemented right. in August, when are they supposed to? They typically do their curriculum guys. work over the summer, and they most LEAs have a regular routine where they bring teachers in to review whatever documents they're looking at or virtual um, unit plans, perhaps, pacing guides, resources. I know that um, as soon as school is finished for teachers, that that's a popular time to bring them in in late June, and then again in mid-July. So it is an aggressive timetable and we very, acknowledge that. Very aggressive. We're mm -hmm. looking for pacing guides for the entire year to be in place by the time the academic year starts in August. Mm -hmm. I probably have several questions, but just with respect to this, um, so many of our districts, I mean, first of all, I think these are prob the, the problems that you're addressing are problems we've known about for some time in one form or another. And districts have been <coughs> modifying within the particular standards that currently exist some of the things that I think you're suggesting, if I'm kind of correct. Um, I regret that this wasn't done in coordination with the standards review because I think the standards review outcome might have been a little bit different and they've been benefited to have this kind of input on what was going on, but that's water on the bridge. Um, so I guess like this will be, I'm concerned that there are portions of this changes that are going to require a lot more time and a lot more staff development, a lot more work. There's also portions of these changes that probably are already in one form or another being implemented and what you're doing is passing along best practices. So can you help me understand how much of that is one way or the other? Or if I'm even correct for that matter. It's a very thoughtful question. Um, I would need to do a little bit more research inside the draft documents as they are to provide you a I want to give you a mathematically accurate answer. Um, my professional opinion, having been a district leader and a math teacher, is that the math hasn't changed. And so teachers know the mathematics. What teachers want to know is, in what course does it exist? And when do I teach it? What is my pacing? And maybe I only get, you know, my pacing for the first half of the course by July 1, but I get the second half 
by July 15th. So that may be something a little bit different than what they're used to. But the mathematics here and the standards haven't changed. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to some concerns that I've had from some district people with respect to this. Okay. We anticipated this being a year-long implementation. And that's not what I'm hearing. And my support or not of, the, of, the, of this has to do with whether it's possible to be accomplished or not. And when I hear something from someone in my district that I just talked with yesterday, that when it tells me that to the extent that they're familiar with this, uh, they were expecting a much longer rollout, and now I'm hearing that the rollout's a whole lot shorter, I'm kind of questioning how much has really been disseminated among the districts. And so if we're expecting to get meaningful feedback in 30 days, uh, there's a lot of education that's got to be done within the district as to what exactly we're asking them to do. It seems we have two two issues. One is mm -hmm. the modifications have been made to the standards. And then the second is how we implement that and the timing of that. Right. Right. And uh, and so perhaps one thing we're bring back to us in June is in, uh, is feedback from districts on the timeline. And the pros and cons of a implementation beginning in August versus implementation a year later. We can do that, certainly. That would, help, that would help inform us about the trade-off. And we can certainly include that in our survey or reach out to LEAs and do a separate one again. Absolutely. Because we don't want to really do it right and rush it, but at the same time, if we're ready and we can move along, let's get the benefit of the improved standards sooner rather than later. Right. And, and that's what we heard across the state. And I'm, I'm not discounting anything that you heard, Mr. Collins, because I've heard both as well. Um, but overwhelmingly, what we've gotten is we've been test driving these standards for four years. We know what needs to change. Let's do it. Let's not wait another year. Um, but I, I completely understand because I have heard those voices. They have not been the loudest, the strongest, or the most. But they are. there are people who have concerns. Well, those are probably the ones that talk to us, the ones who don't <laughs> want to do it. Right, okay. right. Uh, sure. The other question along those lines, and maybe you're going to get to it, has to do with uh, the how the modification standards are going to be reflected on the tests. Yes, I am. That's going to be the other issue that people are going to be asking us about. Yes. I, I think we do need to spend some more time in this discussion about the actual, some changes to the standards. We Absolutely. need a better appreciation of what are the changes. Give us some okay, so I'll continue on. What we did with the data from the LEAs is we analyzed it, interpreted it, reported it, and applied it. And we have some very specific examples of how that happened. Um, the people who came together were a subset of the review committee and the writing teams. And we sat down and we read everything and we looked for common themes without judgment. Then we applied judgment then we make recommendations, and then we come to consensus. Then the writing groups apply that consensus feedback to produce the second draft, to produce an FAQ list, and to develop the rationale document that you have as attachment four. This is what our agenda looked like, just to let you know that we sort of broke people out and came back and had a lot of discussions. There was complete transparency. Everything that we did was shared in Google Docs with committee members who were not present so that they could go back because I mentioned this was a subset. Um, we encouraged them to take this information back to their districts and share it with people, teachers, principals, their leaders as well, and to get feedback. So the process was extremely fluid throughout from February till the end of April, as well as transparent. And that's where we heard a lot about the collaboration and we got a lot of thanks for involving so many different districts across the state as well as our higher ed partners and classroom teachers. So we have a couple pictures here just showing you what some of the teams were doing and who was participating. Um, and these could have been applied to any meeting that we had. Sharing with you some of those big ideas and themes, Mr. Davis, that drove the changes in the from draft one to draft two. Um, a lot of people looked at math two and said that there, you've put too much here. And so that was something that team took a very careful look at. 
Um, we got a lot of feedback about including matrices in Math 1, and so in the second draft, it's back out. Uh, people felt like that was an isolated concept, and even though it is tested on the ACT, that teachers can do that, they don't need a standard for it. Um, they were also concerned with where things went, the math, and what changed, and so we worked really hard to make sure that we were very specific about where standards went from one course to the other and how they changed. Very intentional with the function families and algebra, and that's in your summary and rationale document, and I encourage you, if you haven't had an opportunity to spend time with that document yet, it is a great read to prep you for looking at and trying to understand the standards and the mathematics and where it's gone. So what I'd like to do is you have as attachments one, two, and three our draft standards for North Carolina math one, two, and three. I've put up here an example of what these documents look like and what they're saying. And I think taking you through this a little bit might help you understand the work that was done. So we'll start on the left-hand column, the first column, the current standard abbreviation. So which page are you on? Um, I am actually in the PowerPoint. You could look at any page on any standard, but I put this one in the presentation. Um, it's just a sample from Math 2 in the Algebra Standards, but I can certainly go to a page if you'd like that and do the same thing. I am on slide 25. So the first column on the left-hand side gives us a standard abbreviation, and I'm calling your attention to this because it's an extremely important device. Our resources, such as SchoolNet inside of Homebase, are driven the data in there for both test questions and content are driven by this nomenclature so i'm calling that to your attention for a very specific reason we did not want to change too much of that but we needed to recognize that there was a change in standards and these were now north carolina standards so we kept a portion of that extension in the revision so as not to cause a problem when sorting for content or test questions for our teachers inside the school net, as well as standards-based report cards. The next column is the current standard. So that is the way the standard reads today as it was adopted by the state board four years ago. The next column is the proposed standard abbreviation. So this would be the new nomenclature for the proposed standard. And then the next column, we have the first draft. So that's how the standard read when it was sent out to LEAs. And the next column is the change that took place to create the second draft. So what you have here is a fluid picture of the process. Our next steps I've mentioned before are to open public comment immediately following the meeting, although I do ask that we be allowed an extra hour or two to make some changes to the survey that you mentioned. Um, that We will follow that same process and analyze feedback as it comes in and revise our second draft as appropriate. We're going to continue working on resource documents. <coughs> we already have a tentative schedule set up. Um, to Mr. Collins' concerns about professional development and Ms. Fitch's. So we've worked with stakeholders inside DPI and external stakeholders. Many of our higher ed partners are willing to join us and assist in information sessions and PD. We've worked with our um, statewide system of support team to secure locations. We've not publicly announced them. We don't want to preempt the board in any discussion or decision cycle. We've also worked with um, virtual public schools to keep them abreast of the possible changes should they be adopted, and they are ready, and they've looked at their modules, and they feel very comfortable that those modules can be adjusted in time for their courses as well. We've been also working with the multi-tiered system of support team to look at interventions that might be necessary and ongoing professional development. So in order to support teachers, this comprehensive professional development plan that I mentioned is underway. 
The vision includes a very fluid resource that I mentioned earlier that's available online with print versions and will address the revisions, also have an FAQ section for teachers, commonly asked for resources that are open and educational resources, meaning they're free and open to teachers to use, as well as a chat room, let me ask a question type of thing, and online meeting sessions throughout the implementation. Here are some testing thoughts. Um, testing accountability and the math CNI team have met to review the drafts against the current forms. There are three forms of the current math one and of course assessment. And we've also looked at the math two and three final exams. If after discussion and we come back and this board were to adopt the revised standards for 1617, then the plan would be for North Carolina math two and North Carolina math three to be have their final exams in a field test year. Math one is to be determined yet until a final draft is produced. One additional thought um, before we go back to the questions is we looked very carefully at our fourth level courses against these drafts and last month Mr. Collins had some questions about the fourth level maths and what they were and that sort of thing but we're already analyzing what happens with this draft what do we need to do after that so what we're proposing to do is add review and revision of the fourth level math courses to our K-8 timeline. We would do the both, we would do both of them at the same time. So the K-8 as well as advanced functions and modeling, pre-calculus, discrete, <laughs> and our SREB essentials of college math course would also go through the same revision cycle. That way we can be aligned. Um, there's a lot of discussion about making sure that we keep statistics and quantitative literacy in our fourth maths as well as our three high school maths. And this is a path that both the community college system and our UNC system has taken as well. This concludes my part of the presentation. May I answer any other questions?